Good day and welcome to the Sustainable Materials Management webinar series, a joint effort between the National Recycling Coalition and the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center. My name is Wayne Bowen and I'm the program manager for the Recycling Market Center. I will serve as the moderator today. We'd like to extend a special thank you to Bob Hollis of the Mobius Network for providing webinar management software for this series and Lisa Ruggiero of the National Recycling Coalition providing technical support and the delivery and recording of this program. The subject of today's webinar is product stewardship, who really pays? If you have any questions for the presenters, please submit them using the GoToWebinar dialog box. We will conduct a question and answer session when the final presentation has been completed. With us today are Scott Castle of the Product Stewardship Institute and Neil Hasty of Encore Pacific. And we're going to start off with Scott. Scott is the Chief Executive Officer and Founder of the Product Stewardship Institute. Prior to founding the Institute in 2000, Scott served for seven years as a Director of Waste Policy and Planning for the Massachusetts Executive Office of Environmental Affairs. He is a founding board member and past president of the North American Hazardous Materials Management Association, whose mission is to reduce the toxicity of the municipal waste stream. He is also a founding board member of the Global Product Stewardship Council, which harmonizes product stewardship programs internationally. Scott has worked on product and waste management issues for the past 30 years, worked for a startup solid waste management company, a nonprofit statewide environmental group, and several other government agencies, including the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection and the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority. He is the author of a comprehensive book chapter on product stewardship in the 2008 handbook on household hazardous waste. He was also a syndicated newspaper columnist in Massachusetts and a former columnist for the Boston Business Journal. Scott has a master's degree in environmental policy and dispute resolution from MIT and an undergraduate degree in geology and environmental studies from the University of Pennsylvania. Scott, the program is yours. Great, thank you very much, Wayne. I appreciate it. Um, God, reading that long bio, I get tired. Uh, <laughs> um, a lot of things we're all doing uh, to contribute to uh, better environmental protection. So I uh, appreciate being here and, and talking about uh, a topic which we have not really talked about uh, yet in this way. And I, I really appreciate uh, Neil Hasty being with us as well. So I'm going to start off uh, with, with who we are. Uh, PSI is a nonprofit founded 12 years ago. We have uh, membership from 47 states, over 200 local governments, and partnerships with over 75 companies, organizations, universities, and non-US governments. Um, while our, so our board of directors is state uh, and local government, we have a multi-stakeholder uh, network here. But I'm going to be talking uh, more today about uh, the government perspective. Um, Neil's going to be talking more from the corporate perspective. There's a lot of overlap, a lot of uh, perspectives that are very similar, but emphasis on slightly different things. So from that way, uh, you'll, you'll hopefully hear some of those differences and similarities. So we start with the problem. Um, there's many goods are, are designed to be obsolete, so there's no cost for the manufacturer uh, in the consumers throwing these products out. So there's little incentive for them to create products that last longer or are more easily recycled. Uh, so the result, of course, is that there's a lot of waste out there. In the United States, it's about one ton per person per year, about 250 million tons. Next. It's not only what we see with the products being the waste, but it's also the minerals that uh, we consume uh, along the whole life cycle of making products from the extraction all the way through to manufacture, use, transportation, and ultimate uh, disposal or recycling of those products. And when we dispose of those uh, materials, then we don't see this as well. We don't see that the <clears throat> we need to extract more virgin resources to make more of those products. So there's a lot visible and there's a lot that's invisible in the manufacture and full life cycle of consumer products. US EPA says uh, in their recent study, 42% of US, US greenhouse gas emissions come 
from the products that we use. This is from the energy that is used to, again, make, distribute, um, and, uh, and use, and, and, uh, and consume, and, and end-of-life management all across the whole life cycle. Uh, there's greenhouse gas emissions that are emitted. So it falls on local governments uh, to manage these products, a lot of costs, financial and management costs. And it's millions and millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars of costs that we're paying to manage this, and it's taxpayer funded money for the most part. So there's a lot of externalities. We think about them in terms of environmental, social, and financial, the triple bottom, the triple stool, if you will. Um, triple bottom line. Um, we're going to talk more about the environmental and financial here on this call. There are uh, quite a lot of social um, externalities, but all this is external to the cost of the product. So when we're buying products, we're not really accounting for or paying for the full cost of these products. And that's really the, one of the main messages here and we as a society are, or as a movement are trying to incorporate or include those costs or even reduce any of those impacts um, by incorporating those costs into the purchase price of the product. So we're looking to change the current system through these two terms, product stewardship and extended producer responsibility or EPR. Product stewardship is defined as um, reducing the health and environmental impacts of consumer products all across the life cycle from upstream, the mining end, all the way to downstream, the end of life management of that product, the recycling and disposal of the product. They can be voluntary systems and they can be regulatory or legislative systems. The term EPR in the United States is used to delineate systems that are end of life um, and they are legislated. So the benefits of product stewardship through the investments we make are greater environmental protection um, to save money or fiscal relief and then more recycling jobs. So key here is that we're looking at product stewardship as an investment, needing some funding up front in order to have much greater benefits in the back end. Well, there's two basic ways uh, of getting there. Again, we're oversimplifying, of course, but we can do it through voluntary initiatives. We can reach those goals through regulatory or legislative means or a combination of the two. Uh, on this call, we're going to take the right fork, <laughs> if you will, for the most uh, part of our discussion. Uh, but recognize, and then we will talk a little bit on the voluntary side, but just recognize that there are two forks here and they, they really intertwine and work uh, one to uh, with, with each other often throughout the process. It's not this linear, but um, this is for depictive purposes. <laughs> So for voluntary initiatives, quite a few. Um, you can see here, you know, you have uh, staples, electronics and computers. You have call to recycle batteries, uh, you know, Whole Foods, the Gimme 5 plastics program, you have ceiling tiles, thermostats, lamps. There's a lot of, uh, there are many manufacturers and often retailers that are uh, doing voluntary initiatives and these should be recognized as cost internalization, that they are the cost to run these programs are part of the business model for these companies. They, uh, no one's telling them how much to charge. As a matter of fact, they don't charge. These are free programs um, that are available. Uh, many like Dell and other companies, they have their own electronics programs as well. Even if there's an a, a EPR law, there are many voluntary uh, programs and it's cost internalized. But if we switch to the laws, just a quick overview here for those that haven't seen our uh, charts and maps. Uh, this is uh, a bar chart showing the growth in EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility Laws, since 2000. You can see over the past eight or nine years, quite a lot of, uh, quite more, quite a few more laws passed. There's 70 laws in 32 states on 10 different product categories. See the California's in the lead with six laws passed, Maine and Vermont five, and at least one, uh, one uh, at least 32 states have passed at least one EPR law of the 10. In terms of the laws that are passed, starting the bottom left, three laws on paint, not a three on fluorescent lamps, eight on batteries, nine on thermostats, 14 on mercury auto switches, and 24 EPR laws on electronics. 
All right, so in terms of who pays for all this, well, what we're doing, what we're looking to do is to shift the financial and management responsibility. That is the way we, we think about it because uh, in some cases, as you'll see, uh, that both are by one party or another, financial and management responsibility, meaning financial is the dollars and management is who's operating and who's actually you know, involved and, and working these systems through and, and has the ultimate management role. Um, so right now, government has uh, taken most of that financial and management responsibility and EPR is looking to shift that from taxpayer funded government programs to the marketplace um, and to consumers. So to the manufacturers really and ultimately to the marketplace and consumers. And what this means, and this is again looking at it with the government lens, um, what most of them see, although it's the finance, it's it's the uh, environmental protection, that's what, why they're doing their jobs. They see big dollar savings, and that's what's driving this uh, nationally. So if they're saving millions, if not billions of dollars nationally on this uh, for all these products, they can free up money for firefighters, police, and school teachers and other municipal services. Well, who pays for waste management now in the United States? And this is a, a, a general slide. Um, it's, very, it's much more complicated, as you know, than this. And I was the waste policy director in Massachusetts. I'm mostly familiar with that lens. But the, there's multiple models. It's regionally dependent. What goes on in the Northeast is different than the Northwest and the South and so forth. But uh, we can say that some involve manufacture of products, which is the EPRN, but there are many or most that are non-EPR funding, and these are um, ones which we can have a discussion on a little bit later. Uh, so taxpayers through the property taxes are funding the majority of the systems, but sometimes you have individual households that are paying 100% of the cost. We used to call them washed hands communities. If the community says, okay, household, you're on your own, you got a contract with waste management or whoever it is, and you know, and and, and figure out the recycling of the cost and you do it yourself, you're paying 100%. Uh, many municipalities have flat garbage fees, so there's one rate for the user, the user pay, but often it's partially subsidized by taxpayers through, through the property taxes. Uh, on the pay as you throw, it is very similar that way, that there's partially user fee and partially taxpayer, but the user fee is variable rate, and that's the, 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 that gives quite a lot of incentive for recycling and reduction. But suffice to say for payment that it is partially a user or consumer uh, and also partially from the tax base as well. And then there's other model of landfill surcharges that are either individual or municipality. There's enterprise funds and a lot of different ways of running these programs. Uh, but um, for the most part, taxpayer funded. Now, under an EPR system, there's two basic models, and, and Neil, I want to thank you for your, either your slide, I kind of adopted, or adapted, excuse me, adopted and adapted uh, one of your great slides for this, and I use a little bit different terminology, but uh, the, those that are on the phone can hear some of the similarities and maybe some differences. So we, can, we have two models uh, here in the U.S., EPR, and I'll call it an ARF, is another model separate from EPR, but extended producer responsibility, where there's a direct payment by the obligated producer under law, the producer being obligated, and they will pay into what, what is called a producer responsibility organization, uh, PRO for short. Um, it is a nonprofit of the producers, and they um, th it could either be in the sense of um, model A, 1A, cost internalization, which is the typical kind of pure form of EPR as we know it and has been proposed and uh, promoted here in the United States where the EPR costs um, of running the system, collection, transportation, and processing is included in the product price throughout the supply chain. And w what's um, unique about this is it is producer managed and producer financed. Um, there's a variation off of this EPR system called an eco fee, and this is it's a different term in Canada than in the U.S. Eco fee in the U.S. means that the producer is uh, showing a separate fee on the supply chain transactions um, that some retailers then can make it visible. Uh, it's up to the retailer and the manufacturer if they want to. Uh, show that visibly to the consumer on a receipt, um, but we consider this as producer-managed and consumer-financed, 
where the consumer is ultimately going to pay. There's a specific amount that they're going to pay. And the main difference in the eco fee in the U.S. and Canada, if I do understand it correctly, and Neil, when you speak, you can maybe refer to this, is that the fee is mandated by law to be passed on to the consumer. So in the law, it'll use the word assessment um, in the, the paint law um, in carpet in the United States, where it'll, um, it'll require the manufacturer to include an assessment a fee that's passed on to the retailer and then passed on to the consumer. It doesn't say how much. That's determined in a plan that's submitted from the producer to the state agency. Um, in Canada, I believe that it's not mandated, but it is still uh, a, a practice that is done that there is a, a fee passed on. So whether it's mandatory or not, it's still done, and this is the eco fee aspect. So you can see it is it is uh, slightly different than the cost internalization model, and that slight difference uh, is a, a big conceptual difference in the field. Um, the, both of these are much different than the advanced recycling fee concept, which is a directly pay by the consumer a visible fee. It's government managed and consumer financed and not considered EPR in the United States. So I wanted to depict this more visually um, and these are some uh, just simple uh, conceptual uh, slides that we use. Uh, this one here is on cost internalization. So for the producer, um, you can see the top left there, the circle producer, they are paying um, into a stewardship organization. They can implement the program individually, but if they do so collectively by banding together um, under a stewardship organization for efficiency purposes, they uh, the stewardship organization will discharge that responsibility for all those producers and it's an industry run program. They'll contract out the services. Uh, and then the producer will uh, pass on the cost or not um, to the retailer and then on to the consumer. There's nothing in the law, nothing in the program that says how much they need to do this. They may just incorporate those costs and they might have another product, another division, and, you know, and figure out an or, or not even charge anything more. They, it's just part of the cost of doing business for that producer. Um, and they will figure out, you know, if the purchase price of their product for that particular take back program needs to go up. Um, but there's nothing in the law that says that they have to do one thing or another. So it is very, very flexible for the producer. Um, and it's again passed on to the retailer and on to the consumer. Next slide. The difference with the eco fee is very similar on the right hand side of this, uh, this diagram, but the key difference is where the producer uh, would include a set cost per product sold um, that they would pass on to the retailer. As I said, it's, it's listed as, quote, an assessment in the legislation. It doesn't say how much, um, but there is a set cost that the producer needs to pass on to the retailer and a set cost that the retailer needs to pass on to the consumer. Uh, they, they have antitrust um, uh, language and, and um, uh, uh, language in the law that, that allows them to do this or else it could be collusion um, to, to do so by passing on the same cost from a producer. So it's allowed in the legislation, um, but it is specified here that it needs to go uh, to the consumer uh, all the way through. And, and the, the part that producers like is that they can guarantee that they're going to get their costs covered. That's why uh, the, you know, the, the paint industry and carpet industry went this route on their legislation. Next slide. And again, uh, advanced recycling fee, you can see now more visually why this is not producer responsibility because the producer is cut out completely. You have the consumer paying a visible fee to the retailer and the retailer then uh, submitting that money usually into a government run fund and there's government run programs um, that come out of it. So I have two more to wrap up. Um, so I wanted to give you some examples um, of EPR, ARF, and voluntary uh, product stewardship. Um, so you see EPR, the cost internalization, is the more prominent model here in the United States where there's 24 e-waste laws. If we count Utah, maybe not, so it could be 23 um, e-waste laws, 25 overall in the United States. Uh, but there's 14 auto switch laws. But then there's an end of life vehicle solutions program, um, a organization um, aptly named ELVES that runs this voluntary initiative um, that is nationwide past the 14 you know, states but also others and, and it's all cost uh, all cost internalized by, uh, by a, v a variety of players. Um, there's nine thermostat laws uh, but then there's the TRC, Thermostat Recycling Corporation Program, which is voluntary 
nationally, and that is internalized by the company. Uh, uh, similarly, eight battery laws and a national call to recycle voluntary program, which is cost internalized, and then three mercury lamp laws, and then there's other company program uh, laws that are pr uh, programs that are implemented voluntarily. Uh, for the eco fee, there's three paint laws and one carpet law. Uh, and then the ARF, you have the one e-waste law, which is California passed in 2004. And uh, after that, there have not been any uh, ARF laws passed in the United States because there is much more of an interest in the cost internalization or, you know, or the eco fee here in the United States. Uh, but there were are, there were many older laws, some uh, many still in existence on lead acid batteries, motor oil, and tires that are ARFs. And to wrap up, uh, just how do, how do the stewardship organizations apportion the cost? You have call to recycle. Uh, they have a licensing fee it's, um, that they uh, sell, if you will, or have a charge for putting that, that symbol on the battery, and it's based on battery chemistry and battery weight sold. That's how they get their revenue. It's in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, paint Care is the uh, stewardship organization for the paint program in the United States. Uh, producers pay a per gallon assessment. Uh, you have packaging. The example here we have is Eco Enterprises Quebec, which is in the province of Quebec in Canada. And producers there pay based on material type, um, the packaging type, the weight, and the other factors. And they apportion it by market share. Uh, they, they currently have a shared responsibility model where the producers pay 50% of the costs and the municipalities pay the other 50, but that is moving towards 100% producer financed, but not 100% producer managed at this point. Um, and then on carpet, you have the Carpet America Recovery Effort, and they pay point, uh, 5 cents per square yard in one law in California, and uh, there's partial payment. Uh, this is only a partial recovery of the cost, but it's to stimulate recycling. So you can see there's, there's a lot of variables, a lot of varieties of these systems. We're all in the infancy in some ways here in the United States. Uh, Canada has a great deal more experience than we do, and that's why we look to our colleagues um, in Canada, those like Neil Hasty, who's going to be talking to you next. So um, I look forward to the discussion later on. Okay, thank you, Scott. Again, for our attendees, we will hold a Q&A after our next presentation. If you have questions for the presenters, please submit them using the GoToWebinar dialog box. Our next presenter is Neil Hasty, President and CEO of Encore Pacific. Founded in British Columbia in 1994, Encore is an industry-operated, nonprofit product stewardship corporation that acts on behalf of 1,000-plus brand owners of non-alcoholic and alcoholic beverages. Additionally, Encore manages the recycling of dairy containers on behalf of the Dairy Council of BC and manages end-of-life electronics on behalf of the Electronic Stewardship Association of BC. Neil has working relationships with the Product Stewardship Councils in British Columbia, California, and the Pacific Northwest. Encore is a sustaining partner of PSI and a member of the Executive Committee of the Global Product Stewardship Council in Sydney, Australia, and of the Recycling Council of British Columbia. Neil has worked in the retail industry for more than 35 years. During this period, he has held senior operating positions with several multi-outlet chains. He holds a BS from Bishop's University in Quebec and an MBA from York University in Toronto. Neil? Uh, Wayne, thank you very much and good afternoon to all of those on the call. It's a great pleasure for me to have this opportunity to describe the Canadian experience around the topic of uh, who pays. The Canadian experience uh, really started uh, 15 years ago when some of the very early programs were developed primarily here in British Columbia out on the west coast. So we've been having the discussion, the development and the debate for uh, really the last 10 or 15 years about what's the best approach to take in managing at the end of life consumer products and packaging. And I think it's fair to say that the debate is now over in Canada. We have an organization called the Canadian Councils of Ministers of the Environment. And in 2009, they adopted on behalf of the 10 provinces in, in Canada, the policy position that EPR was the appropriate policy under which to manage an increasingly problematic waste stream and it was the policy that was adopted by all 10 of the provinces 
and it was intended to lead to an outcome that all consumer products and packaging in Canada would eventually be managed under an EPR system. And as part of that debate, as you can well expect, there was a very, very robust debate about the question of who, who's paying. And so to that extent, uh, we have had uh, and seen many sides of the discussion, and I think Scott's presentation uh, sets out the overall broad context quite clearly that has been, in fact, uh, now implemented in Canada. And at the end of it, it's the consumer and the user of those consumer products and packaging who are, in fact, paying some of the amounts by which they pay and the methods, and I will get into those in just a moment, vary, of course, depending upon the product stream and the nature of the uh, supply chain that exists and handles so those products in the Canadian market. And I think it's fair to say that having had the debate and having concluded it and having moved past the uh, maybe somewhat esoteric question about who pays, now the real focus in Canada is about performances. Uh, this is one of those slides that whenever I'm in the audience and somebody puts up a slide that is so small that <laughs> nobody can read it and then of course the speaker always makes the same apology which I will make is I'm sorry about how <laughs> unreadable this slide is but it, it's here to give you a sense for the state of maturation of EPR programs in Canada. Uh, we have quite a number of programs for a country of something like 35 million. Uh, the development has been particularly rapid in the last four or five years and more particularly uh, recently uh, in here in British Columbia, which I, I think I'm probably okay to say has been one of the pioneers in EPR development in Canada. And then more recently, our government here passed a law obligating the producers of packaging and printed papers to take on 100% financial and operational responsibility for packaging and printed paper. So we are moving along very, very quickly, and you can see that by this slide. Uh, here in British Columbia, incidentally, you have about 14 regulated programs and in the introduction, um, it was described that Encore has a responsibility for a number of those programs. Thinking about the what I've observed as the industry view has developed and I think refined itself over time, there are comments I'd like to make that build upon some of the uh, excellent structural work that uh, Scott presented to you. And, in that for the industry, there is certainly a key question, which is who, but as I indicated to you earlier, that debate is largely now over. But the how, in fact, the pay systems are developed is pretty fundamental, and I'm hoping that that will be a, maybe a, a contribution that I'm able to make to this excellent uh, webinar this morning. Really, the industry is looking to the, having cost certainty. My experience when dealing with industry is that it isn't necessarily that they're looking for the lowest cost, but they're looking for cost certainty so that they can in fact plan forward as to the impact that this responsibility for cost will have on their business models. What they're really keen on is that the right set of principles be put into place for determining the cost that they're going to be responsible for. And I'll come back to, uh, in a few slides forward, to what those principles are that I have seen in play. Clearly, the industry wants to ensure there's a level playing field, and that's kind of a, a normal expectation that there's backdrop uh, regulation in place that creates the level playing field so that you don't get uh, free riders of any particular significance. These are in the regulated programs also increasingly important as we get into a very, very diverse range of consumer products and packaging is that the method of creating the financing system has to fit with the supply chain. Now, supply chains vary significantly depending upon, of course, the nature of the product. For example, uh, products within consumer electronics have a significantly different supply chain 
and involve uh, undoubtedly uh, off offshore supply. Uh, and that's distinctly different from circumstances in which you know, the supply originates, say, for example, in North America. You have within the supply chain potential for multiple assembly points and or in some cases a single manufacturing plant. So the way in which the supply chain works in passing costs through for the products and packaging themselves has a significant impact on what will be efficient for the producers in terms of how they manage the moving through of the cost of end of life management. And it's really obviously an important point of view that this is independent of government in that this is a commercial design or design of a commercial system between commercial partners within the supply chain. So looking at the Canadian circumstance and financing EPR, we've got, as Scott had pointed out, two user pay models, um, a series of uh, industry sectors who use a direct pay by consumers. Uh, incidentally, uh, we don't really have any advanced disposal fee programs left. I think there may be one small one in one of the smaller provinces, but essentially those advanced disposal fee programs have migrated and now are in fact uh, true EPR programs. So their first user pay model, direct pay by consumer, using a visible fee. The second is the direct pay by the company that is obligated, the manufacturer, to a producer responsibility organization, such as the one that I'm involved with, uh, a PRO. And then within that second broad model, there are two iterations of how this actually occurs at an administrative level. In some cases, producers show a separate fee on supply chain transactions. In other words, when the manufacturer sells to the retailer, the fee is also identified separately from the product price. And then some retailers in that circumstance will then choose to make that fee visible or they may not. And I want to follow up on one of Scott's points. He's absolutely right that there is no obligation in our laws to make fees visible. This is entirely left to the actors within the, uh, within the supply chain. Uh, there are, of course, other and fairly common uh, as an iteration as well that these EPR costs are embedded in the product price throughout the supply chain transactions. So just to give you now a sense for how these uh, pay programs uh, vary by the type of material. The direct pay by consumers, where the consumer is paying directly at retail and that those funds then flow through to the producer responsibility organization. The most common case where that occurs are with the legacy programs that have been around for some time, and particularly with tires. Uh, we now have the second kind of program, which are those emerging out of the waste electrical and electronic equipment laws that we have in Canada, and we have those in most provinces. And so for consumer electronics, uh, typically display devices, uh, monitors and televisions, and uh, CPUs, computers, and the other range of electronic uh, devices, uh, they typically use a visible fee. Uh, consumer electrical devices, which are now becoming legislated in Canada for things such as uh, microwaves, small appliances, uh, a whole other range of things such as power tools. In fact, in British Columbia, effective July the 1st of this year, we will have a law that obligates manufacturers of all devices that either have a battery or, or a plug, all devices in consumers' homes will be part of an EPR program and you can see that these direct pay are largely all similar in that there is a visible fee. Now the, the second kind of system is the direct pay to the producer responsibility organization. And in terms of the legacy programs, and I'll, I'll, uh, these are just the programs that probably started 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, paint and household special waste, a visible fee, medications, beverage containers, typically a visible fee. These are the bottle bill uh, laws that we have in Canada. Used oil and antifreeze, typically a visible fee. Electrical and electronic equipment. Uh, 
direct pay programs to the PRO for wireless devices, household batteries, and electronic toys. Those, of course, do not have, those are costs that are embedded within the product prices as it moves through the supply chain. And however, that those fees, such as they do exist, are then, of course, still remitted to the PRO, so the PRO has proper revenue to be able to offset the costs. And finally, packaging and printed papers. Uh, and we still have cost share programs with those, but increasingly, and I mentioned British Columbia has now moved to 100% uh, producer pay program for packaging and printed papers. So I had said that I would talk a little bit about my sense for the principles that are important to industry. I can go through these very quickly because I'm repeating a little bit of what I might have set out in the table earlier in the discussion that principles for are important to industry, and this isn't necessarily exhaustive, but I think these are sort of the highlights, that the supply chain, in fact, determines and administers the fees uh, so that, the, that there are, are no other entities, particularly not government, that is involved in determining and administering fees. All the fee revenue that's generated is retained to finance EPR costs, so there are no diversion of the monies to uh, governmental organizations. Thirdly, there's no cross-subsidy between discrete product categories, so that's a very important uh, consideration and principle for industry because it's inevitable, and I gave the example of my own organization, that we manage beverage containers under a bottle bill, we manage uh, end-of-life electronics under a contract, and we manage um, dairy containers in a voluntary program while you can well accept that none of those producer groups want to see migration of costs from one program to another. So no cross-subsidy is very important. And finally, in terms of transparency and accountability, the financial statements for the producer responsibility organizations are verified by third party using generally accepted accounting principles and are available to the public. I'm getting close now to wrapping up, and but I wanted to uh, just finish off with the state of the law in Canada. Uh, Canadian EPR laws are generally silent on how producers are to finance diversion programs. And that is certainly the case here in British Columbia. The government takes the view that that's something best determined by industry. And it's in fact best determined in the relationships within the supply chain and more particularly in the relationship that retailers have with their consumers. And therefore that's why the laws here largely, two exceptions, Quebec and New Brunswick, currently have legislation that prohibits visible fees and um, there's a dramatic discussion going on as to whether or not that in fact is constitutional that in fact a provincial authority actually can in fact intrude that way in the supply chain activities in their province but we'll leave that until another day and finally Ontario our largest population province are taking steps at a policy level to discourage visible fees I think the questions that are still important questions and uh, however are questions I think which are still open. Does EPR produce better environmental performance? Uh, by EPR and I agree with Scott's definition I'm really talking here about legislated uh, EPR programs as distinct from voluntary programs. Uh, although I don't want to rest too much on the distinction between those two because both can in fact uh, be very successful depending upon the jurisdiction. So the first question is does EPR produce better environmental performance? An important question. I think there's growing evidence that an EPR program can in fact deliver better environmental performance but it depends upon how they're organized. And the, the depends part, of course, is sort of fundamental. Second question, is there any evidence that a particular EPR financing model drives better environmental performance? So does it make any difference whether or not it is a direct consumer pay, whether or not it's a consumer paying into the PRO or the manufacturer paying into the PRO? whether the fee is visible or included in the product pricing, is there any evidence that, that those different models 
actually have a specific identifiable impact on environmental performance. I can say that in the Canadian circumstance, we've not seen the evidence. I'm not arguing that there might not be some, maybe it's a matter of time, but in the Canadian circumstance, we've not seen any evidence that there is, in fact, any connection between actual environmental performance measured on the normal metrics that I think we're all familiar with and the type of EPR financing scheme that's been selected. And finally, which is a, a variation on question number two, number three is, does government dictating EPR financing produce better environmental performance? I think you can sense what my answer is going to be is, well, of course not, uh, since the financing models themselves do not seem to have a direct impact on environmental performance. Why would the government determining the EPR financing model now suddenly actually be connected to environmental performance. I think most of us understand government dictates it has to do with politics and not policy. And so I would conclude by saying that the experience in Canada is that uh, on, on two of these questions, the answer is no. And But EPR does have this quality that it produces better environmental performance. Just wanted to conclude now, that's my last slide, by saying that I'm pretty pleased to have this opportunity. Typically I know you think of Canada as exporting hockey players and cold fronts. If there's anything in our experience that actually can work in the U.S. experience, then uh, I'm really pleased to have this chance to provide this kind of perspective. Wayne, back to you. Thank you, Neil. That was very excellent. Uh, again, if, if anyone has any questions, please enter them in the GoToWebinar dialog box. We do have a few which we will address. Um, uh, the first one is actually a comment on, on Scott's presentation on the slide showing the uh, divergent paths of uh, the roadways. Uh, this uh, attendee suggests a third uh, roadway of uh, free market opportunities. Would you like to comment on that? Free market opportunities. Uh, well, I see that there's free market opportunities uh, both in voluntary and regulatory systems. Uh, I would see that that is ultimately what we're one of the goals of these systems um, is uh, for voluntary uh, opportunities, and those are usually business to business. Um, you know, there those that's the definition of a free market opportunity, if you will. It's perceived by the by the, uh, the business sector and acts upon, um, and in terms of uh, there being the, the actual value, we can see it for some of the, um, hearing a little bit of echo now into my ear, but um, there, there's, uh, there's actual value for toner cartridges, lead acid batteries, and others, and, and so those are, you know, those, those are already there. Um, for the regulatory systems, again, I think one of the goals um, in, the, in the government group as we're talking about it, they, they're not into the control of these systems for, for you know, for argument's sake or for, um, for they, their goal would be that they stimulate private sector opportunities. Um, so I would say I that would the say best that, government yeah. systems are those that do stimulate the private sector and offer opportunities for growth in the private sector ultimately so that economies of scale can take place, the supply of the material increases, and that the amount of regulation is minimal. And I think that uh, Neil and I would agree on this, that in, in British Columbia, particularly across Canada, that British Columbia is known as a a government system uh, that is looser, less prescriptive than other systems across Canada. And those are the kind of systems that we're looking at here in the United States to import, if you will, um, in addition to some cold fronts during very hot, warm days here in the, in the, in, in the United States. Okay, next question. Is government allowed to charge a registration or other fee to manufacturers to cover administration costs to make sure producers are complying with legislative programs? Uh, I can uh, I can start with that, and then Neil, I'd like to know how it's done in Canada. But the registration fees um, are usually considered, um, from a government perspective, as paying for the administration and oversight of the program. Uh, we all think it's very important that 
these programs not be, uh, you know, an unfunded mandate, if you will, for government, but that they actually have the resources in order to carry out their responsibilities. Again, we're looking for the role of government to be minimal, but this is a classic role of oversight, enforcement, and, um, and planning. Uh, so those registration fees are, are best set to bring in the funding that can cover the cost for government for usually, you know, a staff person or bits and pieces of several staff people in order to run the program. Uh, I know that in some governments, even if they have the funding coming in through their EPR law, uh, they still don't have the authority to hire somebody. So to the extent that the authorization can be included in the legislation for a state environmental agency to hire the staff needed to run the program, again, that will meet the goals of not only the agency, but also the private sector, which it is overseeing. Neil, do you want to comment on, on what the registration fee, uh, the purpose of that in Canada and how it is perceived by corporations as well as the government? Yes, yeah, sure thing, Scott. The general pattern here is where the government has established a delegated administrative organization to oversee the actual EPR program, then the cost, the administrative cost, the, the rent and the wages and whatnot of the delegated administrative organization uh, are uh, paid for through fees that are charged to the individual EPR programs and so we have uh, programs and provinces in which these delegated administrative organizations who have a sole purpose to administer the EPR laws uh, are in fact uh, obligated to be self-funding by charging fees to the industry sector. Uh, it is not necessarily the case that all of our programs are overseen by these delegated administrative organizations. For example, in British Columbia, we do not have that legislative structure, and therefore there are no fees that move from industry to any level of government. The general industry view is that um, they are happy, happy is the wrong word, they understand that they need to pay for uh, specific work done that's specific to their programs, and they have a concern, however, when that uh, activity of the delegated administrative organization wanders off into sometimes very interesting explorations of very esoteric topics that has nothing to do with, the, in fact, delivery of the programs. And that's where then those costs can roll very quickly. Those costs are usually not under any specific set of administrative rules from the relevant government and so they can grow very quickly and, and hence obviously those are concerns that industry has. Yeah, if I could just jump in uh, and, and to follow up, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because it, it just points to the need for very active and ongoing communication between the government agency, which is the regulatory body and the producer or other regulatory or, or those that, are, that it is regulating and that there be uh, a very clear communication um, and understanding about what the program's purpose is, uh, what the, the role of the government will be, um, and and if there's funding that is for register, you know, in the registration fee, which is the easier way to do it, if you will, or one of the easier ways to do it in the registration fee uh, itself, which would be paid um, by you know by, by the, the companies, um, then then the, it, there's got to be an understanding that government is uh, is being paid for activities which are essential to the smooth operation of the program itself. Um, and these these costs are then included along with other costs for the company as the, the company is going tallying up the costs. And Neil, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. It might be helpful for you know for, for you as as the CEO of uh, you know of a stewardship organization, how you incorporate in any of the costs, let's say the you know, the various elements. There's there's the government cost for oversight and management, then there's the cost to run the program, then there's cost for education and, and other things. Um, and can you give a little insight to all of us as to 
you know, how you go through that internal process, what some of the major elements of a budget might be, how they might be similar in the products that you're managing. I know it's a big question, but I, I know that you, you do a good job with the management there of your programs. Uh, so at the uh, largest cost that uh, we incur, and I think that is generally the case for any of the EPR programs in Canada, has to do with the cost of setting up and maintaining the collection system. So it's by far and away often uh, 70 to 75 percent of all of the costs. The next largest chunk is in whatever logistics costs you have to move the material and to consolidate it and move it to final end markets. And the third largest cost is our consumer public education costs, which we believe are really, although they're not of the same quantum as those other two costs I've just mentioned, that we believe that that is a fundamental success factor for Canadian EPR programs is the commitment to continuous investment in, uh, in consumer education. The costs that are associated with government uh, oversight are actually, in some respects, it's, it's sort of like a mosquito bite. They, they're irritating as heck. They aren't necessarily fatal um, and they aren't necessarily always all that large. I think they just have a kind of a symbolic uh, effect that many of us have and that is that government costs uh, often are not connected, at least not visibly connected, to the actual worth or value being provided. And so the, I think, uh, however, the quantum of them, Scott, is not large by comparison with overall, uh, if it's 1% of overall operating costs, and that, that, that would even surprise me. Again. Great. There's uh, several questions here concerning electronics recycling, so I'll try and jumble them all into one. Uh, concerning uh, some, some states are still having issues uh, with collection infrastructure. Uh, another is uh, concerning education, educating the public about electronics recycling, and one is about costs. You know, one asks the question, how much does it cost to recycle a, a CRT or a, a CPU? Any response to that? Go ahead, Neil. You're working uh, on those. Yeah, the cost experience uh, varies significantly depending upon uh, the nature of your market and something as basic as uh, population density. In most Canadian provinces, uh, I think any of you that have come up to visit us, uh, you, we have a large, large amount of territory and very, very few people. So our costs to operate these programs uh, can be quite high, particularly on the transportation side. The, um, uh, the, the thing that's sort of most fundamental about uh, costs are that um, we subject our costs to a competitive bid environment. And uh, in order to arrive at best possible costs, in order to deliver for the manufacturers uh, the best possible experience, the it is the, one of the fundamental assets or uh, capabilities that a PRO, Producer Responsibility Organization, has to develop is the ability to uh, forward estimate costs and then operate in a competitive environment and getting best possible costs. The, um, uh, I think I caught at the end of it, Wayne, the question about you know, public education. I don't know that there's a formula, but the uh, more important thing I think is that for uh, large programs such as electronics in particular, it's pretty, uh, pretty important that there be continuing education uh, year after year. We've been doing this now for five years. The program started here in 2007, and I'm still amazed that my next door neighbor doesn't realize that they can take their old obsolete electronics down to one of the uh, recycling depots, even though he and I see each other at the local cocktail parties on a regular basis. So uh, getting consumers to understand what to do and where to take the material is a long-term commitment and uh, one that you have to stick to. 
Well, Neil, I, I guess you don't invite that guy over uh, t too often for dinner, but uh, you know, I'm sure he'll turn around at some point just by osmosis being near you. But <laughs> let me let me um, just offer um, a follow-up to Neil. He mentioned uh, competitive, so you know, the questions are around infrastructure, education, and cost. And um, so, you know, in the United States, we do leave it um, in in, um, in the laws. Um, most of most, if not all, the electronics laws here for EPR, they leave it to the individual producer. Um, you know, it's the responsibility of that producer to meet the um, requirements of the law, and then uh, that producer can ban with a collective organization, MRM is one such organization in the United States, there are others, and, and the, the, the concept that Neil mentioned of competitiveness is included, so that there will be either each individual company will bid out the services for its own share of the, uh, the materials that need to be collected, or that is done by an organization like Neil has you know, here in the United States, where, um, where they they operate on behalf of, uh, you know, uh, more than one, uh, if not quite a few companies, and they're looking for the best price. So it, you know, it, it will drive down the cost. I guess one of the questions, if I can, you know, also include some of the the, the questions that I have within that other one is um, how how Neil is the collection cost for government covered in Canada. It's a big issue here in the United States. Some of the uh, laws on electronics, they require the, um, that municipalities, if, it's, if they're being collected or any collection site, be paid, say, a per pound amount for the, the amount of uh, electronics that are collected. Uh, it's not universal, but it, you know, covering a, the cost for a local government, um, their staffing, their the space, the equipment, uh, the operations, you know, for them to collect the products. Um, it, it is an interest across all products here, but electronics is the one where several states have um, have included those in their laws in order to recover some of those uh, often overlooked costs of you know getting the material from the consumer to a a certain location. And I'm wondering, uh, that's how it is here in the United States. Uh, how how is that handled in Canada? Number of the provinces, Scott, use uh, I'd call them hybrid collection systems that are made up of a combination of traditional private sector collectors and the local government um, uh, drop-off facilities, or that have been previously used for other uh, household hazardous materials and general approach here is that the uh, firstly there is to be in fact a payment so that there is no offloading of costs from the producer organization back down to local government uh, the intention is however also to ensure that the fee payment the amount being paid per pound is identical irrespective of whether or not it is a private sector operated collection site or a local government operated collection site. We don't see very much differentiation between the two. I think as a, uh, a discipline within the development of an EPR program, having a single price list that's paid to a collection organization I think is very important and that generally is the approach taken here. Uh, I should also say, Scott, that we have some local governments who, as a matter of their own policy, have said that they will not participate as collection sites or industry-operated programs except during a transition period, uh, something in two to three years as the industry is putting in place alternatives to the local government sites. Other uh, of the local governments have said that, no, they wish to participate because they have uh, what would become stranded assets, because in Canada we're moving to the circumstance, Scott, in which before very long, all of these products are going to be in EPR programs, and of course local government is looking at what was historically their role and wanting to ensure that assets they've built over time still have, uh, still have value. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, next question for Neil. Why is Ontario and other provinces discouraging visible fees? Uh, Wayne, that's, uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm looking at this from a distance and uh, uh, I, so the way I characterize it is probably going to be unfair, but anyway, that's never held me back in the past. And in Quebec, they believe that there is this direct connection between uh, requiring the manufacturer to embed the fee in the product price as the only way to drive design for the environment. They believe that unless they require that, that they're not going to be able to stimulate uh, design for the environment. Uh, that's the Quebec government position and has been for, for a long time, notwithstanding the fact that the evidence of that connection is tenuous at best, uh, even in the European marketplace in which EPR has been in force for a longer period of time. The Ontario government uh, several years ago had a very unfortunate experience with the introduction of a visible fee on certain kinds of products and it blew up in their face and uh, not surprisingly uh, governments were risk averse and don't want to see that kind of publicity. They're starting to make moves, not at a legislative level, Wayne, but more in terms of trying to influence producers to, uh, to uh, embed these costs in the product price as opposed to having visible fees. Having said that, in Ontario, they have quite a number of very successful programs, including the electronics program that does have visible fees. If I could just follow up here in, in the United States, since it is a, a big debate um, as well. Um, that I think that the, those who are promoting the invisible fee, if you will, or the cost internalization over an eco fee or the visible, where there's a visible fee usually, um, and I'll speak for, you know, there's a preference um, uh, certainly among government officials this way, um, all environmental groups certainly all like the cost internalization. Um, there are some um, in, in the corporations that do prefer the, um, the cost internalization, like call to recycle, for example, uh, we'll, we'll say that. Um, but um, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, one is you mentioned the design, and I think that the, I would agree with Neil that there, there's a lot more research that needs to take place. I, I think that most would agree that um, EPR uh, does not, uh, there's no direct connection to EPR and design changes for the products. But I think that what, what is what is kind of left un, uh, unknown at this point, and I think that there is an, uh, there's a sense among those who, who promote this that there is some degree of influence or impact. It may be small on some products, it may be larger on other products, um, that there is some element of a, of a thought process, a change in design, a um, that that there's a movement towards more sustainability uh, from uh, with through the supply chain if it is made more explicit that that a uh, the manufacturer you know has to incorporate this fully into the purchase price of the product. Now again, that's that's a little bit different. Um, this gets down to the eco fee differences in Canada and then in the United States, so that could account for perhaps slightly different um, answers that we have here because uh, the eco fees, as I said, are more required uh, in the legislation in the United States where they're not in Canada. There's much more flexibility there. The other thing with the, the visible fee, there's a concern over the, of the political element that visible fees are seen uh, as taxes here in the United States on occasion. Um, and even the pain program, which is backed uh, fully by the, the American Coatings Association, the pain industry, um, they have run into some uh, political opposition by fiscal conservatives um, in those states, and uh, it is because they perceive this this visible fee as a tax. Um, they prefer to see it, you know, cost internalized, if you will. Uh, of course, they don't like to see any cost passed on to business at all. Um, but they, the visible fee does raise the political hackles, if you will. And then it gets down to the flexibility element that um, it, it's perceived as more flexible, more opportunities for the businesses. But here's where you know, Neil's uh, on stronger footing because he's representing the companies. And you know, they, they ultimately, uh, you want to get their buy-in uh, on these programs. So it, it is a very, very interesting and important discussion that will continue here in the United States and Canada. 
And a follow-up to that question, do visible fee programs result in higher administration costs for the PROs? And what about increasing costs for government oversight? Uh, maybe I could take a stab at that one, Wayne. I think the answer is that no, they, um, they don't really end up driving higher administration costs. In the first instance, a fee has to be calculated. You need to know what, in fact, the members of your group, the manufacturers that are, uh, you're representing, you need to be able to determine what it is they're going to pay on the various products that they're placing in the marketplace. So you still have to have the, uh, the systems and the information gathering and the staff to calculate what the fee is. Whether the fee is made visible or not really doesn't change your costs of having to make sure you're calculating and levying the appropriate fee. Um, from the government perspective, um, I suppose that there is an argument that they will end up having more uh, noise in the channels that they have to manage, Wayne, because fee is public. Although I, I can tell you that the experience we've had, and it varies dramatically from, I guess, jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but to Scott's point, uh, our experience here in British Columbia, where we have visible fees on a very, very wide range of products, when it just has not ended up being all that, firstly, it's not political. Uh, we have governments of both sides of the political spectrum who support the current programs in British Columbia. And secondly, it tends not to be something that once properly explained, that the consumer really gets uh, angry about and therefore it has, it has not become a political football here in British Columbia at all. Okay, question for both. Doesn't EPR essentially result in a value-added tax on consumers purchasing the associated products? Is a VAT more or less regressive, in your opinion, than a traditional property tax funded system in the market? Well, Neil, since the, the value-added taxes are much more prevalent there in, in, Euro, in Europe, I don't know how they are in Canada. I don't know if you want to take a shot. I, I, I can have an answer, but I, I'm sure it'll be very well thought out. Yeah, we do have uh, value-added taxes uh, in, in Canada, and uh, that's a little bit of part of the controversy about visible fees, too, is that uh, the value-added tax applies to that fee as well. So it's in a way it's a layering on of taxes. The um, I think it is probably fair to characterize that when, uh, when there's a fee that's visible, uh, that it's similar to a value added tax. The difference, of course, is, and this is I think pretty fundamental in terms of tax policy, is by definition a tax goes to a level of government. Uh, the visible fees that are used in Canada do not go to government. So it is not, in fact, technically or legally tax and because those monies raised go directly to the producer responsibility organizations and uh, uh, I forgot the second part of the question Wayne I'm sorry uh, I could just follow up quickly with that because um, I know we're nearing the, the end of the time here but uh, it is it, it, thank you Neil um, the taxes uh, certain the taxes are for more of the government um, uh, revenue funding overall into the coffers of, uh, of government and can disappear for its purpose. The fees, you know, are, are, that term is usually uh, meaning for a specific purpose for the, uh, so it would go for that particular recycling of that product, for example. Uh, but the, the, the overall thing I can say is that, uh, you know, we, we do hear from some, hey, we don't want to raise any uh, any costs for the consumer about uh, you know any of these programs and this is a this is the standard uh, uh, I think we need to be very upfront um, about uh, the fact that there may be some cost increase for a consumer for um, the the benefit that they and society will receive for these programs and that's why it's really important to measure them we see EPR and product stewardship as an investment uh, and there may be a small upfront cost for uh, reducing pollution, uh, greater environmental benefits, increasing supply, which will increase increasing the supply of the secondary materials, which then uh, allows for greater economic development, more recycling jobs, 
and lower overall costs of the entire system and lower costs for government. Um, so if, if you know, sometimes that is behind these questions and, and there's a no new taxes pledge or you know, consumers can't pay any more and we don't believe in that, in that mindset. Uh, it needs to be justified for sure and that is uh, ultimately what it's about but it does need to be perceived and understood as an investment. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. When converting to full producer responsibility for printed paper and packaging, do publicly owned MRFs bid on providing processing capacity? Um, we maybe I'll uh, take that one on and describe uh, where we are in British Columbia because if this will be, I believe, the first 100% uh, producer pay and producer operated program in Canada when it is implemented in 2014. So there is about two years in which the industry is working out the kind of question that you're now posing as to what will be the regime under which contracts will be offered and contracts will be administered. And it is, I think, it's still early days here in British Columbia. Uh, it is the case that certainly right now, uh, local governments uh, issue and award and manage contracts now for curbside collection of packaging and printed paper. And it is uh, yet to be determined what the contract model will look like under the uh, EPR system that will come into effect in, uh, in May of 2014. So it's one of the key debates that's going on and the industry is engaging both the, uh, the producers, uh, local governments and the waste haul industry to determine what would be the most effective way, particularly in the transition period, to, uh, to manage uh, a new contracting uh, world that will now emerge in British Columbia. So I, sorry that's uh, kind of an evasive answer, but I think it's sort of one of those stay tuned, Wayne, and then we'll have a uh, better sense for that. In, yeah, I think in the next uh, six to nine months. Okay, thank you. Uh, I believe we're out of time. Uh, again, thank you, Scott Neal, for providing that excellent uh, presentation. This webinar, as well as past webinars, have been recorded and are available for viewing on the NRC and RMC websites. Please join us for our next webinar scheduled for July 16, 2012, at 1.30 Eastern Time. The topic will be sustainability efforts in the healthcare industry with a focus on plastics recycling. Again, thank you for attending and have a great day.